Um, so this uh, is the fourth Sunday of Easter, better known as Good Shepherd Sunday. Oh, okay. One of my favorite Sundays of the church here. And uh, um, we'll be talking about how Jesus is our Good Shepherd. So uh, and the hymns and the theme, and well, you'll hear all that as we go through that. But not all the readings point directly Jesus as the Good Shepherd because we're reading our first reading, we're reading through the book of Acts. And then our second reading, we're reading through 1 John, uh, but we'll see how that ties it all together. So I'm going to start with our first reading from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. Now, um, just kind of put this in context, um, beginning of chapter 3, G, uh, Peter and John healed this lame guy who couldn't walk, um, and this guy's, and everybody's going freaking out, oh, how did this all happen? And... Um, you know, the, the, then the people are around saying, who, who are you? Are you gods or something? And Peter going, nope, we're just, this man is healed because of Jesus, um, you know, faith in the name and things going like that. So the next chapter, chapter four, it's still, there's people are still talking about this um, and trying to figure this out. Now, what's happening is that the disciples are doing exactly what Jesus told them to do, to witness to the resurrection of Jesus. So that's what they're doing. And... Um, we're going to be hearing about these guys named the Sadducees. And the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. They, they don't. There are, there are three major groups, religious groups, uh, in first century Jerusalem, Judea, Israel. Uh, one of the Pharisees, that's the largest group. They, we would call them the more conservative group. Of the, of the three, um, it's believed that Jesus may have been a Pharisee or came from that um, group um, before he started his earthly ministry, public earthly ministry. Um, the second group, and they believed in all the Bible, all the Old Testament, so Genesis through Malachi. So that they're, they hold to that. Uh, they also believe in the resurrection of the dead. That was their big thing. The second group were the Sadducees, which was much smaller group than the Pharisees. Uh, the Sadducees were um, the, they were the religious leaders of the day. So that we're going to hear about this, the chief priests and, this, and these peace, people in political, spiritual, whatever you want to call it, power. Um, these were, the majority of them were Sadducees, and they did not believe in the resurrection. They only believe in the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, and so, um, so if you ever got trapped and you both had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, questioning you and getting ready, just bring up the word resurrection and then they'll get distracted with that and you could sneak out because they're, they would be going after it. And then the last group uh, would be uh, what we call the scribes. And they were the ones that literally, they copied the, the book of the Old Testament. They physically wrote it out. So they're the ones that knew the scriptures, at least they thought they knew the scriptures, because these are the ones that would come up to Jesus and say, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus? What's the greatest, you know, what, what does it say? What does God say about this? And Jesus said, would say, you're so close, so close, but you're just missing it by that much. And they would, he, what he means is, you're missing it because I am the fulfillment of this, the things that you write. So this is what we have. So now we're, we're dealing with the Sadducees. Um, and... Uh, so as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the capital of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So this is after Pentecost. The disciples are, are, are witnessing to the resurrection of Jesus and people are coming to faith. Now, it wasn't so much that people were coming to faith. That was the big problem for the Sadducees. They were afraid that these people might take their place and their power and authority in Jerusalem. That was, that was the big deal because they were becoming bigger and bigger and more powerful. So that was kind of what was going on with that. Uh, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, who was his father-in-law, John and Alexander, not John the apostle. This is John. He's related to 
Annas and Caiaphas, um, and Alexander, and all who were of high priest of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, "By what power or by what name did you do this?" Meaning, heal this man who was lame. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, "Rulers of the people and elders." If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man had been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that, has, that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so, once again, and I like how um, Luke is writing this. He writes the book of Acts. So he's, he says, by, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter stands up and says, yeah, it is this Jesus who did this, the one that you crucified. And he could look at Annas and Caiaphas because they were the ones saying, what should we do with Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him. God raised him from the dead. You're, gonna, you're having a problem with this because many more and more people are starting to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And there are, there are, as we find out from the Apostle Paul, at least 500, if not more, who saw the resurrected Jesus. So they got to figure out what they're, how they're going to do with this because they're going, people are believing that this Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior. And then he who died is now risen from the dead? Huh? What are we going to do with that? And this, there's no salvation except in Jesus. That, I mean, and, and Peter and the apostles, Paul will do that. We'll always go back to that. It's only in Jesus that one is saved. One that believes and trusts what Jesus has done for that person, suffering, die, rising again, for the forgiveness of sins, eternal life and salvation. It's only this Jesus who has saved that person, saved you and saved me. Um, and so we have this going on. So they're, you know, it's getting a little tense here in Jerusalem. Um, but the apostles are just going, we're just going to say what Jesus told us to say. And that was kind of the command that Jesus gave to them. Just, and don't worry about what you're going to say because, you know, the words will come to you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will say what you need to say. Um, and so um, we have that going on. So that's the first reading. Do the Jews today, do they believe in the resurrection? Are they like the Sadducees? Yes, they do. They're more like the Pharisees than the Sadducees, the majority of them, okay. because they believe when Messiah will come, and, okay. whoever that is, in their mind, whoever that Messiah will come, that uh, God will raise every Jew. Every Jew? Not the rest of them. Every Jew... And then they'll all go to, and the map's not up there. They're all going to come to Jerusalem so that the, the, uh, um, the Jewish nation would be reestablished like in the days of King David. And they would be the world power. So then they are like the Sadducees. No, the majority of them are more like, we would call them more Pharisees. They're not Pharisees and Sadducees today, no. as we understand it here. But they're, they're going, once Messiah comes, then he will establish the earthly kingdom and then he will raise every, from Abraham until the person died yesterday, will raise them all and that that will be the great nation. And who's going to want to go fight the nation of Israel when you got billions, trillions? I mean, I have no idea how many Jewish people there are between Abraham and today. I don't know. So that's the thought behind that. That's what that's that's what that's they're they're thinking about that. So do they have the same Bible we have? Well, they have the same Old Testament we do, but not the New Testament. But they'll read it. I just say we read our Old Testament by putting our Jesus glasses on and saying, "Oh, Jesus is the fulfillment of this. Oh, Jesus is the fulfillment of that." They put their Messiah glasses on and saying, "Oh, this is what the Messiah is going to do." And not, etern not spiritual salvation, but Earth. earthly, establish the kingdom as it was in the days of King David. And we get to go back to that where we are the world power, that we are in charge, that we are 
have power and authority. That's the, that's the thought with that. Now, you've got to understand that just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you're Jewish. Does that make sense? No. You, yeah, you can, have, you can be a Jewish nationality, but that doesn't mean you believe in the Jewish faith. So that's why I said you can be Jewish without being Jewish, and you can be not being Jewish and being Jewish, if that makes sense. And I'll give the example of uh, Sammy Davis Jr. He was Jewish. I mean, he, he, he became Jewish. I mean, he became, but he's not. He's, you're right, by heritage, he's not. So, um, and uh, we have that. So that's what that is. And even in the Jewish faith, there's, I'd say there's a spectrum as to where you are. You have the extreme Orthodox, who, and these are the guys that you, that when you think of, they're wearing the hat with the curly things, and they're, those are the ultra-Orthodox Jewish people. You know, they're at the Wailing Wall, they're doing their thing. Then you have the, not so much extreme Orthodox. I mean, they might go to synagogue. They might read their, their Old Testament, their Bible, Old Testament, which is the same Old Testament we have. And then you have the, uh, in name and only, and they show up for their equivalent of Christmas and Easter, which would be <laughs> Passover. And I mean, there are three major festivals that took place, Passover, Pentecost, and in the fall, um, booths or tabernacles or they would they would remember and celebrate the uh, wilderness wandering where they would stay in a tent for a week um and they still do that today there are some who still do that today so so we're not the only ones that you know you know other faiths have their cne people <laughs> you know christmas and easter people maybe i missed it but did they do they believe jesus died for their sins no mm -hmm. jesus oh, okay. is not their messiah he was, he was not what they had in mind. Jesus did not come and reestablish an earthly kingdom. In fact, Jesus kept telling them, I'm not, here to, I'm not here to make an earthly kingdom. I'm here to establish the spiritual kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world, as Jesus would say. So they don't believe that. Now, they'll say Jesus was a wonderful teacher. Might have been a prophet. But he died on the cross. I mean, he was a loser. He, he's, not, he's not our savior. So, wow. Do they think the rest of us are just going to hell? Yes. <laughs> yeah, because we're not Jewish. But we do Christians in Jewish, Jo Jodean, I mean, the, the Christian Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. I, mean, we, I mean, we have the Ten Commandments. We have that. It's just that we're, we have two different saviors. They're waiting for the Savior to come, whoever that is. Whoever that is. And, and that will come when, when the temple is rebuilt. So when Jesus okay. died, he just died. That was it. Okay. And they had, they had to not have him raised from the dead. I mean, they had to. That's why they put the stone in it, they sealed it, put the guard around it because they were concerned. Oh, the disciples will come and they'll steal the body and say, aha, he did rise from the dead because that was an Old Testament prophecy that he would rise from the dead. But Jesus didn't need the disciples to do that. I mean, the angels didn't Easter. roll the stone away. And Easter? They don't celebrate Easter, okay. not the way we do. Okay. They celebrate Passover, which is the, the uh, yearly remembrance of how God saved them from their bondage in Egypt. Mm -hmm. that, remember if that put the blood of the, sh the goat or the sheep on the door frame and the, the angel of death will pass over. They still do that. That's still a major festival. That's still, they do celebrate that. They just don't sacrifice the lambs because the sacrificing of lambs can only take place at the temple, and there's no temple in, in Jerusalem right now. Now, the way that Iran wants to bob Israel, that temple might come sooner than later. Yeah. I mean, you kind of, you're going, but that's, that's what that is. So kind of how that happens. All right. All right. Turn to First John chapter three. In, in yeah. This reading, Annas, the high priest. Yes. Is that a man? That is. Oh, okay. This is the same one that they brought before. They brought Jesus on that Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, kind of Annas and Caiaphas. Um, that 
Um, so that they were they were the they were the religious leaders of the day back then. So that these names show up, these are the same guys that were there when you when we read about it on Good Friday, you know that they brought Jesus after the rest in, in the Garden of Gethsemane that they, they brought them here. And then John John and Alexander, we believe, are maybe sons of Annas. Caiaphas is the uh, Annas is, is the I think he's the father in law to Caiaphas, who's the high priest. Just keep it in the family. So so that's what's going on with that. So just remember the Sadducees are sad because they don't believe in the resurrection. You see. All right, 1 John chapter 3. Um, by the, and this is John the Apostle, the guy who wrote the Gospel of John. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if, every, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet, does, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So in other words, walk the talk. Well, I love you. Well, if you don't physically help that person and you have the means to do it, do you really love that person? So that's kind of what, what John is saying there. Uh, verse 19, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him for whenever our hearts condemn us. God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he's commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him and he in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So the commandment that Jesus wants us to keep is that we believe and trust that he's our savior. That's the commandment. Now, the amazing thing is this. He helps us to do that. We don't do that by ourselves. He sends the Holy Spirit so that we can trust and believe that Jesus is our Savior. And that's what that is. Now that we keep the other commandments, remember Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love God. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So when we love God, our expression of that love for God is our love for one another. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. Faith um, that God gives to us expresses itself in love for others. That's what it is, you know. We're saved because of what Jesus has done for us. We love Jesus, and then our love for Jesus is expressed in us loving others. And a scripture that goes with this, whatsoever you do unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you do unto me. Correct, in Matthew chapter 25. Yep. Yep. Here. Yep, that's Matthew 25. That's where yeah. Jesus says, um, you know, because they ask, when did we do it to you when you did it to the least of me? So when, when we're loving others, we're not going, oh, I hope God notices this. We, right. you know, those who, we just do it without even thinking about it. Does that make sense? That we, it's just kind of a, a natural, uh, right. It's just kind of who we are. I and mean, we're not going, oh, I hope God sees how I'm helping Nona here. <laughs> you know, that's not how that goes. But it's, oh, you know. It just happens. That's because that's the faith that we have and express like that. So yes, you are correct. So this this first verse is really it ties in with the uh, um, um, gospel reading that we have. By this we know love that He laid down His life for us. So this is how you know for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. John 3, 16. Oh, look at that. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. Oh, another 3, 16. You know, there's a lot of 3, 16s throughout the Bible. Um, that, uh, and, and that's going on with that, so. All right. 
All right, let's come, let's get to the gospel reason, or the, the gospel lesson, and the reason why we're here today. It's Good Shepherd Sunday. Um, there are, on every year we celebrate Good Shepherd Sunday, and John 10 is the Good Shepherd chapter in the Bible. And we divide it up into three different parts because we have series A and we're in series B. This is what we're reading today. And then we're series C and in it, they kind of divide it up. And so we have this one for us. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Oh, here we go. Oh, by this we know that he laid down his life for us. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. So we kind of have two different parts going on here. This, I am the good shepherd. What does the good shepherd do? He lays down his life for the sheep. He protects the sheep. We're going to get to that in Psalm 23 and how that happens uh, for us. He says, the, good, the hired hand, the one whom the good shepherd hires out, he's, he doesn't own the sheep. He can care less. Oh, there is a big, bad old, you know, whatever. I'm out of here. He says, that's not what the good shepherd does. The good shepherd will give up his life for his sheep. Um, and, and, that, and then he goes on to say, you know, that I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Now, what's very interesting, and we're going to do it in the context where Jesus is in um, Israel, Middle East. And it's kind of the broader thing. There are many um, shepherds, people who take care of sheep in the Middle East and probably here in America just because. Um, and each shepherd, um, he knows his sheep, and his sheep know their shepherd by either by his voice or um, he may whistle a certain way or with that. It's very interesting. Um, you, if you go on and watch, uh, pull a video up on YouTube about shepherds in the Middle East, and there are like thousands and thousands of sheep, and there's like 10 shepherds, and the one shepherd does whatever whistle he does, and he begins to walk away. And all those sheep who are his will begin to follow him. And the rest will stay because that's not the call for them. That's not the call for them. Um, And uh, with that, now, what will happen sometimes is that while he make the call and he'll begin to walk away, there might be some sheep who decide, well, they either didn't hear it or they're going to stick around, and they're looking up, and they're looking around, and they hear all the other shepherds give their calls, and they're going, that's not mine, that's not mine. And then what happens is that they start to cry. And they don't know what to do. And they'll, they'll do stupid things. You know, they'll, like, they'll run into a thicket, and they'll think they're hiding there, and yet the, the wolves love it because that's easy. Because they're stuck. You know, that's why the shepherd will go back and look for the, that sheep who's crying out and um, things like that. So, um, you know, with that. Now, the, this other one, uh, verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of the fold. I must bring them also. Who do you think Jesus is talking about there? All evangelism. Us. All those who are not part of the flock at that particular moment, there are others whom the shepherd is crying out to, um, and either they have not heard or they know what the voice is, but eventually they do, uh, we pray, that they would be part of the one flock. Um, and, and then Jesus talks about how he says, I lay down my life. I make that choice. Now, you know, everything that happened Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, it may look like it was chaotic and 
someone other than Jesus was in control, but Jesus was, God was in control of the whole thing. Everything that happened was under God's control. So he says, I can do that. I lay down my life and then I take it up again. I have the authority to do that and no one else. Uh, and he says, because I've received this from my father. That was just God's plan of salvation, that that was going to happen. All right. Questions, comments? <laughs> All right, let's turn to the psalm of the day. I realize that I've never preached the whole psalm, Psalm 23. In my years here, I've never... So guess what I'm doing Sunday? Okay. You had to memorize that. Oh, yeah. Pastor Stecker still makes... I like how you put that. Still makes them memorize in the King James Version, which is kind of strange because then I have to go back and tell them what that all means. I mean, that's, you want to irritate people, start doing the 23rd Psalm, not in the King James Version. Mm-hmm. And people, oh. so this is not the King James Version. So don't get mad at me, just that's what it's printed out. So we're good. Um, so we have the, um, going back to the gospel, I'm the good shepherd. I, own, uh, I, uh, I know my own, my own know me, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Um, then the 23rd Psalm, a Psalm of David. Now remember, when David was growing up, what did he do? He was a shepherd. He took care of the sheep for dad Jesse. He was the youngest, and um, that was his job. So he took care of sheep. And he would talk about how, um, you know, uh, when Goliath, remember the story about Goliath, and, and Goliath is challenging whoever's there, and David shows up and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That was not a compliment. But this was, who, is, who does this guy think he is? that he can stand up there and mock our God and his people. I'll, I'll fight him. I'll take him on. And we're, I mean, this little teenage mm-hmm. ruddy boy, red boy, whatever you want to call him. Um, Saul gets word and says, hey, well, what, what you, you, why do you think you can do that? And David says something like this. Oh, I often fought off lions and tigers and bears. Thank you. But he does say, I've often fought off uh, bears and, well, lions and tigers don't live in the same place, but I always say that. I just want to see which kids know the movie. So I'm very disappointed in all of you. Now, let me do this again. And David said, no, no, I fought off lions and tigers and bears. Thank you. Um, With that. So David understood what it meant to take care of sheep. God, in the, throughout the Old Testament, would talk about um, his leaders, kings, spiritual leaders, as shepherds of the people. And David, and he writes this, you can see how he understands what it means to be a shepherd. Um, and so we start with, the Lord is my shepherd. And if you notice the word Lord, it's, it's, it's all capitalized, so it's Yahweh. It's the name that... God gives to Moses on the mountain with the burning bush. He says, yeah, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, and the, I always say, my little notes, are, well, what does the shepherd do for us? Well, we learn that Jesus says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He calls them, he takes care of them. And so we see how the rest of the psalm now kind of clarifies and tells us what the good shepherd does. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or... He provides everything I need. I don't have to worry about anything from food daily to eternal salvation. Takes care of it all. I have no, it's all there. I don't have to worry about anything. That's what he does. And then David goes on to say, but let me tell you kind of how specifically he does that. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So he gives me rest. And then... He waters me. Sheep, the only time they will drink water is if the water is still. They will not drink from babbling brooks, rapids. They they need the they they they're kind of kind of freaky about that. Um, that they just need this. So we can say, oh yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. He provides everything I need. Yes, he gives me rest. Rest in knowing that my eternal salvation is all done 
even rest physically that I can, that God's going to take care of everything. And then he leads me beside still waters. Now, if you read the Lutheran commentators on this, and any time you hear the phrase water, what should come to mind? Baptism. Baptism. Okay, I'm a good Lutheran. I'll say sure. You know, that he did lead me to the waters of baptism. That he did make me his very own. Um, and uh, uh, there you have it. So, and then uh, he restoreth my soul, restores my soul. The word, the Hebrew word, could go one of two ways. Uh, one is, um, some say repents, so kind of a change of where I'm going to where I should be going. Or the, the, the phrase also, and I could say, I could see both of this, that he revives me, that... Um, when I'm uh, kind of panicking. I mean, if I think about a sheep that's stick in a, stuck in a thicket and it's crying out and it loses its breath, the, the shepherd comes and saves it and now he can oh, relax. So we have this kind of this beside green pastures, still waters, he restores my soul. He gives me back my breath. I can, I can now um, take great comfort in knowing that what he's doing that. Uh, doing that for me. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Um, shepherds will, many times, will lead their flock, um, and especially in the Middle East, um, and take them where he wants them to go. And this whole, this paths of righteousness because of, because of what he's done for us. So we are in the path of, and I say we're on the pathway to heaven. We are on the pathway of righteousness because he's, he leads us that way. When we follow him, that's where we go um, in, in, dealing, in going through that. Now, sometimes in leading us in the paths of righteousness, sometimes uh, Jesus might will, and this happens to all of us, um, that we walk through places that we probably wouldn't normally go this whole valley of the shadow of death. Now, the King James translated it that way. And yes, you can read it that way. But the literal translation, even though I walk through the valley of darkness, that's kind of the, the thought there, that you can't see what's going on. You can hear, but you can't see. Now, we always, well, when do we normally read the 23rd Psalm? What service do we normally read it at all the time? At a funeral. We always read it at a funeral. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we, always, we often associate, oh, oh, here it is. This person walked through the valley of the shadow of death is now with Jesus. Well, that's true. But it's every day we're walking through the valley of the shadow. We're walking in darkness sometimes. Um, and yet when that happens, if we're following the voice of the good shepherd, I need not fear. I fear no evil, which is wonderful. And the reason why is for you are with me. Now, in, you didn't bring your Hebrew Bibles with you today. <laughs> I know, I forgot to do that. When you go home and open up your Hebrew Bibles and you look at the 23rd Psalm and you count up 26 Hebrew words, and that'll be the center of Psalm 23. And then there's like three words there. And then there's 26 more words that after that. So this phrase, for you are with me, is the very center of this psalm. So at the center of all of this is Jesus. He's the center of it all. So it's kind of a, a cool way to uh, remind us. And, and it doesn't work it out in the English because we use a lot we might use five or six words to use to explain what Hebrew would. So I'm just telling you that, that the whole thing, that the center of this all, of this 23rd Psalm, that we need not fear. We can take great comfort knowing that he is with us. With us. And then this, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, Jesus does not use his rod and his staff on his own sheep. Rods and staffs are used, are used by shepherds to fend away lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Oh, man. 
we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but a rod is a little, I think, I often, I, I, you ever see those mini bats? Those, you know, you got regular size bats and you go, you can get those, some a little bigger than that. And it would be to, to, to fend off whatever yeah. enemies, whatever that is, animals, whatever that, like lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Oh my. Um, with that. And then the, the, the shepherd's staff has that, um, kind of has the hook on the top. And sometimes that is to, you know, if a, she- a sheep picks it up, but it's also to fend off as well. So that we can say, ah, oh, they're, they're our good shepherd. Is there still fighting for us um, to defend us um, from our enemies? Which leads us, now we have this shift from um, that this first part is, the, is directed as to who this, the shepherd is and what he does. Mm-hmm. So we, and then in the middle of it, we move to uh, you are, you are. Um, and then you have, you, and then it's kind of the shift from being sheep to being people. Because we see here, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Normally you wouldn't set a table for a bunch of sheep. But then, if you're a good Lutheran, <laughs> preparing a table, communion. We like to do that. So, you know, that the Lord's Supper is there. And even in the presence of our enemies, you know, I have to say, every time we gather around is to hear God's word, and Jesus says where two or three are in my name, there I am in the midst of them, guess who, was there, who else is there in our midst wanting us not to believe what the good ship, the devil. So we, that, it's always there. So we have this, Wonderful. I mean, if you just do the face value, he's, he's you know, uh, going to provide for all our earthly needs. And even in the midst of enemies there. And then this whole, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Um, that was very common back then is that um, one of the things that a host may do for a guest is wash their feet and put oil on it. But, but this whole anointing, um, one's head, it is also part of that thought as well. And then the cup, you know, that you would sit there and, you know, the, the, it's always full. It's always full um, with that. And then, um, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, um, I'm thankful that the King James people translated the Bible into English. It was the first major translation of the Bible in English. It started with Luther when he translated into the German, but then England said, we need to have our own. And they, um, they, they would translate it, but I, they didn't always do the best job in translating what the words mean. Because this whole, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's a sense of just reading it that and saying, oh, I'm walking along and goodness and mercy are like little puppy dogs coming after me. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what the Hebrew says. That's not David's original um, words. Um, and it, it really, it's this, and surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me and chase me down until I am captured all the days of my life. It's a violent word. It's radaf in Hebrew. And it's the other time that a place is used is when someone is pursuing or chasing after someone else to get them. So this goodness and mercy are not like little puppy dogs looking for us, but this goodness and mercy of God wants to pursue us, wants to track us down wants to chase us, and I like to say, literally tackle us to let us know that we have received God's goodness and his mercy. So that's that's what's going on with that. So it's kind of a, I know I'm kind of blowing your mind here, you know, but that's what that is. And then what, you know, David writes this and what we, you know, we look forward to the day that we dwell in the house of the Lord forever, that we get to go home to heaven and that we will be with him 
forever, which is a great thing. Looking forward to that. Questions? Go ahead. I know. It's one of those. I know. It's one of those. Well, there will be no watches or clocks in heaven, which might. <gasps> you know, but we live in a very linear, very time here in, in this side of heaven. But when we get to heaven, there is no. Are you sure? Yeah. Where did you. Well, what's eternity? There's no time in eternity. It's forever. You're not going to wake up in heaven on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. It's not going to be like that. I don't think people think about that. You? Well, we can't because our finite minds does not let us process it because our lives are so... Like today is April 17th at 1060. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I got some visits to make this wearing. afternoon. I got to get done, you know, blah, 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 and got to get to this, that, and the other place. I mean, that's my, you know, we have, I have calendars on my phone that tell me exactly where I need to be when I need to be there. There will be no use for that in heaven. It's just that we are there. Well, that will be a blessing yeah. when we won't need that. I know. <laughs> Ooh, be pretty cool um, with that. So, um, so sorry, you, you, you won't, you can come in if you want to do lunch. Don't mind us. So, so no watches in heaven. I always find it funny that when people are buried, they have their watch on. I'm going, well, one, eventually that watch will cease to work. Yeah, the battery. All right. So I just. Right. So we put a NASCAR little car in there with right. Grandpa. Yep. <laughs> awesome. They do, they do take off the glasses. And they do that take you that. Can, so. I mean, that's just right. It is. It is. All right. The, the, anyway, the one grandson, he, had, he stole it from our house, the babysat, and then he could not find that. And Dickie said they... No, they finally found it, but it took them like all all night to find that car to put it in Grandpa's Right. I, I, I think, good. wow, thank God. What would he have? Right. That little kid, I don't know, seven, <laughs> six. All right, the colic of the day, it's our traditional Good Shepherd Sunday a prayer. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, uh, grant us your Holy Spirit that we may hear the voice of our shepherd. Uh, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow him where he leads. That is the same prayer that I pray at the cemetery at the committal. It's the same, you know, as we're finishing up with the committal service. That, But, you know, you waken from death the shepherd and grant us your Holy Spirit that we hear and follow and um, that he knows each of us by name and we follow where he leads. Questions, comments? This is amazing. It is. I, this is, I love this Sunday. I'm glad so. it, but I don't know. There was just something in my spirit. I, I need to, I need to, I hope I don't talk too much. <laughs> nah. Thank you. Well, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.